Hello, Blogging Heads Nation, and welcome to a much-delayed edition of Dresbert. Um, we delayed it because there was nothing going on in American foreign policy, and so we thought this with this long lull we'd find... I'm just kidding. We're completely overwhelmed, um, hence uh, the reason for our conversation. So, I'm Daniel Dresner. I'm a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, I also contribute to the Washington Post. And, oh, by the way, did I mention that I have published a book just recently, or rather Oxford University Press just published a book, called The Ideas Industry, How Pessimists, Partisans, and Plutocrats Are Transforming the Marketplace of Ideas. So please buy the book, uh, because I worked really, really hard on it, and the cover is very pretty. I'm Heather Hurlbert. I run the New Models of Policy Change Project at New America. I am almost always a pessimist and not infrequently a partisan. Um, nobody's accused me of being a plutocrat in a while, but there's a first time for everything. There are no plutocrats in this blogging heads. <laughs> yeah, no plutocrats were harmed in the making of this episode. <laughs> but oh. I was I was reminded, um, I, part of the reason this taping is delayed is that I spent last week at the uh, annual Colorado World Affairs Conference, which is this kind of incredible, um, somebody described it as South by Southwest for policy wonks and the people who love them, mostly the people who love them. Um, but I was, I'm going to steal a gimmick from a panel that I was on there since I um, appeared. Actually, I sat in the middle of a screaming ideological fight about nuclear weapons, which hasn't happened to me in a good oh, 20 or 25 years, um, in which one of the participants was Joe Srincioni of Plowshares Fund fame. And Joe reminded us that he had appeared on an episode of The Daily Show um, playing in a game show, which um, Professor Dresner and I are going to replicate for you today. And the title of the game show is Sanction, Bomb, or Mary. Okay, Dan Dresner, Erdogan in Turkey after the referendum. Sanction, Bomb, or Mary? Oh, that's Mary. That's easy. Um, you know, uh, this is an issue involving, um, uh, it's a regrettable decision in terms of the referendum, but it is a referendum that obviously gives uh, Erdogan uh, much more enhanced powers as president, which up until now had been a largely ceremonial post, and I believe ensures that he could stay in power until 2029, yes. something on the order of that. Um, if there is one thing that the, uh, let me put it this way, unless there is a graphic image of Turkish babies uh, somehow suffering as a result of this referendum. Uh, I am fully confident that the Trump administration uh, will not, you know, overly criticize the results of this referendum. And indeed, Erdogan in some ways probably has managed to pull off something that Donald Trump uh, would very much want to pull off if he could, uh, which is somehow rewriting the rules that actually gives him more power. Um, so, I mean, I believe the State Department statement sort of suggested that that you know, called on all sides of the Turkish conflict to, to work together uh, to ensure there wouldn't be further any uh, any further instability. But um, while there are very few constants uh, in the Trump administration's foreign policy, I believe one constant is they are not going to get involved in an ally's uh, internal affairs. So let's be clear. Um, you know, Stephen Cook wrote uh, yesterday that this marked the end of Turkish democracy. So um, there is there is a feeling that what has happened, I mean, it both it both ratifies a period of increasing restrictions of the political space in Turkey, um, a series of purges following the, the coup attempt last year. And, you know, in other times would have been a clear candidate for sanctions um, from both the U.S. and from Europe. Um, so, you know, in addition to the question of will the Trump administration sanction Turkey, there comes the question of. Is there anything that anyone can or should be doing as Turkey wanders off the liberal democratic path? Well, I, I guess the question I would ask you is, to what extent does NATO or should NATO play a role here? It's the most obvious, you know, sort of democratic multilateral institution to which Turkey is a member. Turkey clearly values its NATO membership, obviously. Um, now, it should be noted for the record that NATO was not always, you know, did not always consist of democracies. Um, I believe Portugal was a dictatorship for quite some time, and it was a NATO member. Greece, similarly, was a military dictatorship for quite some time. And Turkey, at various stages, you know, was, would have been labeled a dictatorship as well. But you can argue in the post-Cold War era, that was one of the additional qualities that NATO clearly uh, articulated. And, and, you know, in terms of the Partnership for Peace program, 
and the way in which it expanded to the East. Clearly, one of the criteria for NATO membership was the notion uh, that there would be some degree of democracy and some degree of rule of law. So do you think, you know, I guess two questions. Do you think NATO has a role to play or could NATO play a role here? Um, and second, will it, given that uh, President Trump, while not believing that NATO is any longer obsolete, believes that because he wants NATO to focus much more on counterterrorism rather than on these pesky human rights and democracy issues? Well, your second question is much easier than the first. And the answer is no, NATO. Well, no, unless and until um, things get to a point that sort of the military side of NATO cooperation and of Turkey's role within NATO is threatened, which is not, I should say, out of the question. Um, because, of course, the great, you know, the great, the great point about NATO members not always having been democracies is that the military has been both one of the great pro-Western forces in Turkey and one of the great anti-small-D democratic forces in Turkey, um, particularly in, le- in recent years. Well, first, as, as democracy took power away from the military, and second, in recent years, as it has taken on an, an Islamist cast in Turkey. So, so you, you, would ha- you would have, I mean, it would put a huge strain on the military aspects of the NATO-Turkey relationship to to go hard on to go hard on the democracy and you second I mean face really you would face a key decision moment except you won't face a decision moment because this administration has already made its decision um, that you absolutely need you know for NATO to be relevant either in southeastern Europe and it, the immediately adjoining part of the Middle East and for NATO to be relevant in the context of Russia of deterring. Um, I'm trying to think of what other polite words we use to describe the relationship with Russia. In, in neither of those cases is NATO very relevant without Turkey. So, so you actually, um, you know, this is this is a great place where where your your democratic norms and your realpolitik rub, rub up against each other in in very uncomfortable ways. Right. I mean, so Even President if you're not President Trump, I should say. Right. So I was to say, the, let's imagine the counterfactual here. Let's say that we were either in a you know in another timeline in which Clinton was president, or let's say this had all happened a year ago, in which Obama was president. I'm assuming that the outcome in those circumstances would have been some strongly worded rhetoric from the White House, but not necessarily that much in the way of sanctions beyond symbolic, if they were at all, and certainly no fundamental change uh, in, na- in cooperation with respect to NATO. Or do you yeah, think I'm mean, underplaying? It would be very difficult. I mean, because basically what you'd be trying to do is impose sanctions for, um, a, I don't want to undersell how serious this is, but a mildly dodgy mm-hmm. process. Um, we There are oceans of countries that we don't sanction for having voting processes that are at least as dodgy as what the Turks just did. And and by saying that, I don't in any way want to underemphasize the hard road that the no vote faced. Yeah. Um, you know, the sort of the decrease of the media space and the huge numbers of arrests of intellectuals and journalists and, and so on in recent months. But those aren't things... And even irregularities potentially in the counting of the ballot. Counting itself. But those aren't, just to be blunt, those aren't things that we sanction friendly powers for. And, you know, the other point that I think is worth making is that a President Clinton or a President Obama would have encountered um, a European Union that, A, would say, if anything is going to be done here, it should be done by us and not by NATO. So you, NATO, keep your nose out of it because we're the relevant political actor here. And B, a European Union that, with the French election coming up, um, with the um, and mind you, the, the this referendum campaign had really significant um, sort of blowback in both Germany and the Netherlands. Yeah. So I don't think um, I don't think of even a president who was interested in marshalling a shared Atlantic response to this would have found it would have found it very easygoing. Right. I, I think the difference is more the difference is really at the level of symbolism, and I don't mean to say therefore it's irrelevant. Um, I do suspect, however, that there would at least be some rhetorical action if you had the, you know, you had a President Clinton or you had a President Obama. And whereas on the other hand, this is an administration I think will just say we don't care. I mean, well, will- and the other point that I think is worth making is that this is an administration that there there have been allegations that current and former <laughs> senior figures in the Trump administration yeah. happily talked about how to extradite opponents of the Erdogan regime to Turkey. 
um, right. which is not something that would have happened in a Clinton or that I think did happen in an, in an Obama administration. So, um, you know, to, to go back to your to your initial framing of, of Mary, um, you know, there is an argument that this is the kind of a liberal democracy and friendships among strong leaders that that this administration and all of its leading figures, even the ones that um, the establishment is currently hugging as the adults in the room, are very comfortable dealing with. Right. Um, and furthermore, you know, whether you describe Erdogan as an Islamist or not, what he is undoubtedly at this point is a populist. And certainly that is something that the Trump administration will identify with. Yeah. So that actually makes me want to pivot away from sanctioned bomber Mary for just a moment to this um, this marvelous construct that's that was started to be, you know, the the latest if we're all about who's up, who's down in the Trump administration, um, you know, this is the moment in the sun. Um, and I would say you better watch out because the moment in the sun is followed by the fall into outer darkness as surely as as night follows day. But um, this is the moment that foreign policy wonks have fantasized about for years. People are actually writing stories about how a cabal of foreign policy professionals is supposedly running the U.S. government and calling it the axis of adults. Yeah, so there was an article, I believe, by uh, in the Daily Beast, and um, I believe by Kimberly Dozier, um, that uh, called it the axis of adults, namely referring to... Uh, the generals, um, H.R. McMaster at the National Security Council, uh, John Kelly at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Jim Mattis, who is now the Secretary of Defense, and I think lumped into this also is Rex Tillerson, who is Secretary of State, and potentially I think they referenced Mike Pompeo, who is the CIA director. Um, and the notion is, is that these, these adults actually do things, and this is like mind-blowing, Heather. I know this is going to blow you away. They actually talk to each other before there are National Security Council meetings. Oh they God. might actually get on the same page before they get into a room with the president to articulate what that position would be. That would have never happened in any previous administration. This is real, some real disruptive shit we're talking about here. That is like scheming and devious and um, our other favorite word of the moment from our favorite White House staffer who wants to prove that he did actually go to college. It's almost Machiavellian. There we go. Exactly. No, I'm sorry. I, so, so let's drop the sarcasm. I mean, the reading that Daily Beast piece, um, I was struck by the notion of, oh my God, Tillerson and Mattis actually coordinate before they go in. I would like some degree of institutional memory when people write about this shit, because for the love of God, this is what Clinton and Gates did before they went in to talk to Obama. Um, and you know, it, it, in some ways, it's not necessarily what. Uh, although actually, it's what Gates and Rice did as well before they talked to George W. Bush. In some ways. It's when the cabinet secretaries don't talk to each other that's the anomalous thing rather than 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 the norm. Um, so in that sense, it, it strikes me that this is a that side is a little overhyped. I think the more interesting question to ask is whether this is a real thing, actually indicating that there is some sort of steadying you know steady state in terms of what the Trump administration's foreign policy would look like, or whether it is not. And I have to say I I am of mixed opinion on this, and I, I will. I will make two arguments for why it's not and one argument for why it might be, and then I'll, I will let you explain why I'm wrong on all of these things. The first is, is that I'm beginning to wonder if the Trump administration's foreign policy is basically now suffering the equivalent of the Sports Illustrated cover jinx. Um, <laughs> Which is so, I was waiting for that to be Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, Dan. I yeah, have to say, but yeah, that's pretty sexist of you to assume that was where I was going to go, Heather. I'm a little, I'm a little offended, but uh, we, no, we'll we'll figure that analogy out anywhere else. No, the SI cover jinx is a well known um, is a well known thing among sports fans, in which generally speaking, an athlete who makes the cover of Sports Illustrated because they have had an incredible run up to that moment, the moment they get on the cover, something bad happens. Um, and I believe there's a few studies that actually suggest this is a real phenomenon, although the real phenomenon is in all likelihood, if you, it's, which is not surprising, someone has an incredible run of luck, they do reasonably well, it's noted on the cover, and then regression to the mean happens, which means that something, you know, that, that occurs. But there is that kind of Game of Thrones aspect to the, the, uh, the Trump uh, administration in which anyone who actually makes the cover of a magazine that is not Donald Trump finds issues going forward. And we, you know, the most celebrated example of this was that Time magazine cover uh, of Steve Bannon that, according to too many reports now for me to dismiss, actually clearly annoyed Trump. 
um, because it, it, it made it seem like somehow Trump wasn't the president. So I, I do wonder if Axis of Adults makes the cover of Time or the cover of Newsweek or what have you, um, which you see these guys on, on the cover, whether that will rankle Trump. So I uh, will confess that one of my reasons for wanting us to discuss Kim's article in this Blogging Heads was to do our small part to shape the media landscape and make sure that it gets repeated and appears a bunch of places so that we can conduct our experiment and see whether that is in the fact the case. It's a good point, Heather. This access of adults thing is everywhere. I mean, it has gone viral. I cannot believe how many times I've seen the reference to access, um, access of adults. Um, oh, damn it. I had a second point and now I've lost my train of thought. This is awful. This is why I could never be an adult. Um, oh, no, I, I have it again. So there is part of me also that wonders if one of the things that is going on is sort of a cognitive tick that we in the foreign policy community, and to be fair, I think a lot of journalists have as well right now, which is this utter desperate craving for something normal to be going on, um, which is to say we have had almost 100 days of what I can only describe as chaos and anarchy and not anarchy in the good way. You know, or in the in the neutral IR theory way, but rather <laughs> genuinely. Only a realist like you could say, "Oh, anarchy in the good way." Right, right, right. I said I, I said neutral. I'm sorry about that. But but the point being that you know, literally, you know, every there needs to be a word now for um, the feeling you have if you go on a flight or if you go to bed and you wake up the next morning. And you, you know, turn on your phone and you check Twitter and you literally, in my case, at least get into an intellectual crouch to find out what the fuck are we doing now? You know, what what craziness is ensuing? Um, and that happened to me last, you know, last week when I was going to Chicago, where I get on the, you know, I uh, land in Chicago, pull up Twitter. and Oh, we've apparently dropped the mother of all bombs. Good to know. Um, and so I, I, I think that causes people to desperately search for some kind of narrative that actually suggests we are returning to normalcy. And I think access of adults does that. So I, there is a part of me that really wonders if this is overhyped. Um, the contrary trend, however, and I will say that this does lead me to wonder if maybe we actually are at least seeing some sign of, of routinized order, is essentially the one thing you can say for the access of adults is that they work harder than everyone else. Um, and they have more experience. You know, I mean, I, I disagree with John Kelly on some of what he's done in, in terms of Homeland Security. I'm not sure. I, I don't necessarily think Rex Tillerson has done a great job as Secretary of State. I have heard nothing but good things about McMaster at NSC. But these guys are clearly working. They're actually making an effort to genuinely talk to each other, to coordinate, to think about what policy is going to be like. Um, and compare and contrast that with, let's say, the Jared Kushners of the world, um, who lack things like information and, uh, you know, go on more vacations, let's say, than, than uh, these folks, and are in some ways have a far greater, you know, deficit in terms of just basic policy knowledge. And so even if someone like Kushner, you know, moves down the learning curve, he's not going to be able to move down the learning curve as fast as these guys. Um, and so there are ways in which I do wonder if they will actually be able to run the policy process in such a way that it marginalizes not just someone like Steve Bannon, but also um, the Steve Kushners of the world. Or sorry, the Jared Kushners of the world. Yeah, I'm actually finding as you talk that it's it's very helpful to think about the ways this is in fact exactly in continuity with what cabinet secretaries have done in, in prior administrations. And so I'm I'm thinking, you know, Clinton Gates in, in Obama's first term is a great example. And so yes, I think there's there's reason there's reason to think you're right that everywhere everywhere the Trump machine cedes management space to this group of cabinet secretaries, they can and will run it in a more smooth and competent manner. So I, and I, I would also interject part of this is also McMaster, I think, clearly presumably having a stronger relationship with Mattis and Kelly and so forth than the other White House staffers. Right. However, yeah. and this is where I think the, the Clinton Gates analogy is, is particularly meaningful. Clinton Gates had a bunch of things that they wanted to do in the first term. And Obama and his political team were having none of it. Yeah. And none of it happened. And you can read the Woodward book and other books that in great detail how they lost fight after fight after fight. Um, because the political folks just weren't interested in doing them. And there was a real limit to what cabinet members can do either with a president or with a Congress, because Congress 
is very aware that, you know, the axis of adults is not going to be di- directing any money to their real to their 2018 war chests. So just, you know, it doesn't have to be anything special about the Trump administration, um, but just purely the political fundamentals of how White Houses work in general and how first term White Houses work in particular, that I think the 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 playing field on which they can adult to do the horrible millennial thing and use that as a verb um, <laughs> is is not as big as as the the scheme and i also the other thing that i think is interesting is that is a group of folks that disagree with each other in interesting ways and i think it's worth pointing out say- that so I'm curious, when you say disagree with each other, you mean the adults themselves disagree with The each other. adults themselves disagree with each other. Oh, do, do, do go on about this. I actually do want to hear about this. So, and this, you know, sort of brings us back to our to our bomb sanction or Mary a little bit, because over the weekend you had McMaster in Afghanistan. And McMaster in Afghanistan sounding like McMaster has sounded on Afghanistan for the last 10 or 15 years, which is to say he doesn't believe in proxy forces. He doesn't believe in light footprint. He thinks if you're going to go in and, and you have objectives, you have to put enough boots on the ground to achieve your objectives. So you have McMaster out there making noises, which seem to have sounded like everyone who heard them like McMaster warming up to push for more of a troop presence in Afghanistan. Right. Um, contrary wise, you had other stories coming out. Um, I think it was Eli Lake who had this piece last week, sort of documenting a split among that group about whether to put more combat troops into Syria or not. Um, and forgive yeah. me, Eli, if it was Iraq and not Syria. Um, but Basically suggesting that there is there is I mean, and, you know, this, this is this isn't a new debate. It's the same debate that played out in the Obama cabinet. It's the same debate that played out in the Bush cabinet. Um, it's the same debate that plays out among Pentagon intellectuals. It's the same debate that plays out among, you know, congressional foreign policy thinkers. But um, if the if this if the axis of adults can't come to a compromise on this that will withstand sort of um, sporadic engagement by the political folks on the Trump team. You know, you're you can see um, you can see them being unable to to resist um, more kind of um, national security sort of war by photo op, which is what I think I'll describe what we've had for the last couple of weeks as. You might be correct on that. I, w- I would, to go, both in talking about Afghanistan, but also talking, you know, more generally about the access of adults thing, I, I do think there are some differences between, you, you're correct, the dynamic of the, the White House, and particularly the, politi- the, the political operators in the White House, potentially exercising a veto over this kind of access, I think is, is a correct one. There are a few differences, however, that lead me to wonder if it'll take quite some time for that veto to be exercised in this, this instance. Um, and it's really twofold. The first is, you know, it's what I talked about before. You have the White House being much less experienced on this stuff than the people that he has installed at DOD and now NSC um, and DHS and the intelligence, for that matter, uh, uh, the, uh, the intelligence community as well. And, you know, in some ways, this, this goes back to this notion of how things played out in the Afghanistan um, in Afghanistan in the, in the Obama years, where, as you say in the Bush book, you know, basically... To some extent, the Obama White House got a little bit rolled by the, the Pentagon in that scenario. Um, because, And to be fair, part of this, and this might not apply here, is that Obama, I think, felt vulnerable politically as to whether he was seen as simpatico um, and, and really seen as a friend of the military. But that said, the other difference, and this I think will empower the axis of military adults at least more, is that you know Obama, after that that after that experience, became very, very comfortable saying no to the military um, and saying no to some of the more hawkish members of his national security team in terms of intervention in Syria and in terms of uh, expanding, you know, uh, expanding interventions elsewhere. And the one time he did listen to them, I think he will always you know, tell himself, was Libya, which did not turn out uh, in the way that he had planned. So you could particularly argue that the entire second term of the Obama administration was one in which Obama didn't care whether he said no to the military or not. It, and in that sense, foreign policy got really centralized within the White House. Trump, on the other hand, is someone who I think takes great glee 
And this is, to be fair, one of the few things that he talked about during the campaign that he see, appears to have implemented. Um, I'm not going to question my generals, basically. Um, you know, if the generals want to drop this kind of ordinance or want to do that kind of thing, there's not going to be any real pushback uh, from the president on this. So it might be the case that folks like Bannon or, you know, Priebus or even Kushner might be sensitive to the political effects of whatever uh, the Axis of Adults is proposing. I also suspect that the president himself um, doesn't have necessarily the inclination to oppose his generals. Um, now, maybe that'll change if there is actually a disastrous thing that happens. Um, it, although, but that said, it's worthy to note that something like the Yemen raid doesn't seem to have deterred Trump in any way whatsoever um, from, you know, authorizing further use of force. And indeed, the Yemen raid is an example where it does seem like folks like Madison McMaster know exactly how to play Trump to get what they want, which is to say all they have to say is Obama would never have approved this. Well, I think the idea of, oh, Trump won't say no to the generals is um, it's a little bit, it, it um, oversimplifies sort of the back and forth situation. Um, because I think you also have the reverse problem, which is um, the generals are not dying to say no to Trump. And yep. so I do think that that Yemen raid is likely to be more an example of of the nobody having been willing to say, you know, no, there's a reason we didn't do this raid before um, or, you know, the Syria attack being all right. So the guy wants to do something. Let's give him sort of the most off the harmless shelf plan off the shelf plan that we have. And, you know, whatever options we give him, let's let's do them in a way so that he'll pick that one, which, you know, they know very well how to do. Um, so so there is there is that dynamic, I think, to watch as well. And then, you know, the second the person who we both shamefully neglected to mention, but who I think is highly relevant here um, and who does come up in the axis of adults conversation is Nikki Haley. Yes, and right. Nikki Haley is highly relevant to this conversation in two ways. One is she has almost immediately figured out how to use the bully pulpit she has at the UN. And it is fascinating how much the way she uses it looks like every UN ambassador for what, 20, 25 years now? I mean, going back to the kind of Madeleine Albright, I mean, in, in many ways, yeah. you know, Albright sets the mold for what does the post Cold War UN ambassador look like? And Haley, very much to her credit as a political operator, frankly, um, you know, looks to me like she has very astutely figured out. And, you know, you'll notice until until the White House fired him out from under her, she was very carefully using the career people she inherited to try to, to figure out how to how to do that. But I think that throws another sort of dimension in here. Because she then, to a certain respect, is going to be channeling some of the political blowback. And very much in ways that past UN ambassadors have been able to leverage various sort of sub-communities in American politics who wanted to see things get done. Um, she is, I think, already doing that, is going to be able to do that, and is going gonna, is gonna to be another lever for um, sort of traditional... Um, Repub traditional Republican interventionist foreign policy, for lack of a, I'm not meaning to use that word in a judgmental way, one way or the other. It's just kind of an easy way to, to describe the genre. And so where her instinct, you know, sort of if you imagine a scenario where she and Priebus and either Mattis or McMaster are on the same side, with, you know, some thing that Trump is dying to do, you can see, um, you can see a missile coming out of the station very fast there. Yeah. It, there is an interesting division of labor here, and you. So I wrote a post last week, I think, about uh, about Nikki Haley, uh, which shockingly, I believe, the Washington Free Beacon misinterpreted uh, because of my headline, where I, the headline I wrote is how the ordinary Nikki Haley is uh, uh, becoming extraordinary in the Trump administration. Dude, dude, dude! You're supposed to say that you didn't write the headline. You're going to mess it up no, for I all totally of us everywhere headline. if you admit to writing your own. Because whenever anyone hates the headline. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. So nope, that's on me. I write the headlines for my thing, which is what. I mean, something Man, you're that messing I, this up for the rest of us. I'm sorry. Well, no, others might not. I, I, you know, I, I know for everyone else they don't control it. But in my case, I did that on purpose. And the reason was is that when I was saying the ordinary Nikki Haley, I didn't mean to just mean to describe her as ordinary in the sense of she's dull or or not above average or anything. 
But it, in some ways, what you said, what she was doing as a U.N. ambassador is perfectly ordinary when you compare her to what previous U.N. ambassadors have done. She is not in any way all that different from what Samantha Power did in terms of being the U.N. ambassador or Susan Rice before her um, or, uh, you know, John Negroponte or Madeleine Albright. Um, these are all, you know, ambitious people that either aspired to greater political heights and or greater diplomatic heights. So it is not shocking. Um, and indeed, it's perfectly ordinary that Nikki Haley is behaving the way she is. But the point I made is that, that what matters is not so much what Nikki Haley is doing, but rather what the entire rest of the Trump administration is doing and the president himself, which is to say that you're in operating. She's operating in a world where Rex Tillerson clearly does not want to get in front of a camera at all. And based on what he says when he does get in front of a camera, should not get in front of a camera. Uh, until he gets a lot more media training, because he's not good at this at all. Um, and indeed, it, it, it does suggest an interesting division of labor in which Haley is going to play a lot larger role, um, more outsized role than even ordinary U.N. ambassadors, precisely because she's so good at this. Um, and furthermore, the second reason is that Trump himself watches cable news. And so if Haley is on it, that's a way in which, you know, Haley or anyone else who is good at being on cable news can actually influence um, the president. And I will, you know, I, I'm just going to stop you for a second because I haven't thought of this before, but there's such an interesting way that the Haley Tillerson pairing is reminiscent of the Albright Christopher pairing at the in the first um, Clinton, because Christopher, um, may he rest in peace. Um, Christopher actually had a stutter and had had to do serious um, training just to be able to give a speech in public. Oh. And um, I can say, because I was a speechwriter for him, that Warren Christopher was a wonderful human being, but he was not a scintillating public speaker. Yeah. Um, and he, in retrospect, benefited greatly from not being alive in the age of social media um, because he was mocked and scorned relentlessly for his bad media performance. And I, I can't even imagine what that what that would have been like now. But similarly, Albright. Um, and Albright was not someone who had the sort of electoral experience that Haley has. So, you know, Albright was able to really take that pulpit and, and seize it and seize it and turn it into something. And that interesting. But but the other point of that, and I think Christopher, you know, got got greatly maligned. However, you cannot imagine Bill Clinton's second term as a foreign policy president without kind of the steadying hand and tutelage of of um Christopher in the first term. Now, now that ain't what's going on with Donald Trump. But right. if you if you you know, if you think of the role of a secretary of state in the first term as kind of a setup guy, the raises it's just it's, it's I think, interesting and evocative to, to compare them. No, that's an interesting parallel. I hadn't thought about it. The other thing I will say, and again, this is what I, I said in the post last week, and I think it is, it's not there is a certain irony here that the professional politician uh, is the one who is now thriving in the Trump administration. You know, say what you will about Nikki Haley in terms of, of uh, her politics. And uh, there, as, ma as, as many as people on the right have been boosting her, there are people on the left who seem really, really afraid of her or, or have been trying to detract from her. The point is she's a politician. She's yeah. good at, 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 and she's a good politician. Um, and there are not that many of those in the Trump administration that actually have political experience. And so I think part of the reason Haley is thriving is precisely because you know, she's actually a decent political operator. She's clearly good on camera. She clearly works on her brief. These are things I admire. I admire competency at this point, you know. And, and so, um, uh, so I, again, all credit to her for, for taking advantage of a situation where I don't know if anyone could have anticipated that, that she would have been as relevant now as she, uh, she would. But I, she's clearly made the most of it, I think. Well, it does also, it's another one of those dirty little secrets that many, many people are convinced that there is absolutely no relationship between domestic politics and international politics. And if you come from the world of one, you can't possibly understand the other. But, you know, spoiler alert, human behavior is human behavior. Yeah. And if you are, I mean, the trick is that you have to be sort of humble enough to know what you don't know. Right. Um, but if you if you are willing to consider that you might need to learn something, you know, your basic instincts will serve you extremely well moving from if you were successful in one field, you can be successful in the other. Right. So moving on to our uh, sanctioned bomber, Mary, I believe the the next issue is and we I can't believe it's taking this long to get to it is uh, North Korea. Well, what's really fun about North Korea, which actually just totally demolishes the premise of the conversation we were just having, is that um, in the last week, we've literally heard all three 
from right. No, my answer to that was going to be um, uh, sanction bomber Mary. The Trump administration believes why not do all of them? You know, the, the, which is entirely consistent if you think about it with Donald Trump's history. So um, it, it's yeah. You it, it the administration has been all over the map on this. Um, I think the most interesting thing. A simultaneously disturbing thing was what Mike Pence said as vice president. We haven't talked about him yet, but he made a surprise visit apparently to the DMZ um, while we were all sleeping and said, among other things, the era of strategic patience is over and that the uh, the North Koreans should uh, wake up and pay attention that the fact that the Trump administration has been willing to use, uh, you know, military force in either in both Syria and in Afghanistan should send a powerful signal um to North Korea, and, and reading that, I, I, I'm not going to lie, I giggle a little bit. So you should, I think, um, explain for our those of our audience that don't do that don't do um, military strategy. The point being that um, the arsenal that North Korea has and the strategic situation that it sits in makes the comparison to the 69 missiles we launched at the airplanes that the Syrians chose to leave behind on an airfield. Um, kind of laugh, or even the mother of all bombs, kind yeah. of laughable by comparison. Right. The fact is, the strategic situation in North Korea is very different from the strategic situation in either Afghanistan or Syria. Um, but what is more interesting is this notion, and it was ru- it's been run with by a lot of Trump administration supporters. Again, is this overall like faith in credibility that the, the you know this goes back to these debates that we had back in 2013. You know, when Obama backed down on on his threat to bomb Syria and instead took the deal from Putin with respect to the chemical weapons. And there was a whole flurry of debates after that about whether or not Obama, by not showing resolve in that situation, had essentially given the green light, you know, for Putin to move in on Ukraine or, or uh, China in terms of the South China Sea. And indeed, there were even at Obama administration officials um, who suggested that this was problematic. Both Kerry and Hagel, I think, uh talked about this uh, as potentially problematic going forward, which I thought was a a load of crap. Um, And I think it's a load of crap this time. The notion that the North Koreans are somehow going to look at the Trump administration using the the Moab in Afghanistan or launching tomahawks in Syria, thinking, oh my God, they're actually serious about using force. They could really use it on us, um, I I think is genuinely uh, ridiculous because the strategic situations are so different. And I think this is genuinely a moment where Daryl Press, who's a professor at Dartmouth um, and wrote a book called Calculating Credibility, talks about the fact that the situation is far more important than these kinds of, you know, uh, cross-situational examples of reputation. Um, and indeed, I believe that the North Koreans have already responded by something along the lines of saying they're going to run a missile test every week or something. Um, Which is full employment for bloggers and, um, you know, hot tape (laughs) writers. So so we probably owe um, Kim Jong-un a vote of thanks for that one, because people will continue to want to have us talk, which is our only reason for existing. Right. So thank you. I know. I I mean, this is hashtag I I occasionally use and I really do firmly believe, which is make America boring again. Um, And this is an example where, yeah, the world's interesting and we're going to write about it and talk about it a lot. But damn, I would prefer not to have to do that. Right. But um, back on your back on your credibility point, I do think you actually have seen demonstrations of of sort of three different theories of credibility um, playing out among senior members of the administration. And one is the one you talked about that came from Pence, that right. came from Trump himself last week. You know, this kind of the best way to be credible is to threaten to use force and to make demonstrations of how you can use force, even if it's not entirely relevant to the situation. The second one, you know, you saw um, Madison McMaster give very terse statements around the um, the failed missile launch the other day. Right. Um, and that's the kind of, you know, in, in an interesting way, that's the more sophisticated version of the unpredictability that Trump promised on the campaign. You know, right. we're just going to note that it happened and we're going to let you sit there and wonder if we had anything to do with it, yes. um, which uh, is, 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 you know, is pretty smart positioning in one way. If you think that kind of of sort of John Wayne credibility, I'll almost call it, you know, that it's rather than rather than loudly threatening what you're going to do, silently appear to be threatening. Um, so that's another model. And then there was this um, sort of um, statement from Tillerson earlier today that I don't really know what to make. And um, because the administration also put out, you know, having having announced that the era of strategic patience was over, 
they put out what is our new strategy on North Korea? Well, we're going to put maximum pressure on them, um, which is great because yeah. you know if they if they can find any sanctions that we weren't sanctioning them with before, you know, good luck to them. Go to town. Um, maximum pressure and engagement, which was really interesting to me because first of all, you couldn't tell if maximum modified engagement as well as pressure. Um, or not. So so constructive ambiguity there. But, oh, engagement, you said to yourself, that's interesting. I wonder what they mean by that. And an enterprising reporter went to Tillerson today and asked what was meant by that. And mm-hmm. so, and, you know, so, for example, did, oh, no, Tillerson answered. No, no, bad move. Sorry, go ahead. Did they mean this is like kids like Dan goes to a horror movie and yells, no, no, don't go in the closet. <laughs> No, the reporter will write what you say. Sorry, go ahead. So, um, and and you know, the the reporter, having read the statement which said the goal continues to be the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, um, said to Tillerson, "So, what would the preconditions for talking be?" And Tillerson gave like the saddest, "Well, if she'd only show any interest in going out with me," answer of sort of, "Well." There'd have to be an indi- and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not getting the words exactly right, but there'd have to be an indication of the possibility of progress. And actually, you know, if what you're trying to do is signal to the North Koreans, hey, we want to talk, that's a good way of doing it. That's true. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, he may very well be conducting his own independent foreign policy and he may be ready to, to talk to the North Koreans. And I, I have a piece that I... I have a piece that I think will be out in uh, New York shortly um, predicting which which Trump administration official is most likely to be Dennis Rodman and show up in Pyongyang. <laughs> so you have to check my piece to find out which one I predict. But um, oh, oh, nice suspense. I will have to look at this. Um, <laughs> but that's it's really three different theories of credibility in international relations. So it's very interesting. Um, you know, Susan Glasser at Politico now does this podcast series, I guess, um, in which she interviews various people. And her interview this week was with Michael Anton, who essentially has Ben Rhodes's old position as the head of strategic communications at the National Security. Now, Council. now, now, that is very unfair to Ben Rhodes. Well, it is the same position, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> you know, um, although uh, I, I think right, and Rex Tillerson has the same position as George Marshall. OK, Anton. I mean, if, right. But the important thing is, is that Anton has the, the is head of strategic communications for the National Security Council. He was also known as being one of the few intellectuals that, that supported Trump uh, during the campaign. He wrote under a pseudonym, them, I believe his name was Decius, or, um, you know, arguing, uh, wrote a, uh, an essay called The Flight 93 Election, um, in which he's just not a good intellectual. There's no other way to put this. Um, you know, I, I read his writing. Uh, he wrote an article for American Affairs, uh, which is this new Trump journal, which is not very good. And in this interview with Glasser, he simultaneously manages to say, on the one hand, it's a good thing that, that Trump is acting the way he is. He's like Machiavelli. He's constantly, you know, surprising um, his adversaries. And, and it's a good thing to be this kind of, un, you know, to, to be unpredictable, unpredictable like this. You know, as you say, consistent with your sort of notion of, of, of belief in tactful surprise. And yet in the exact same interview, Anton also complains, but you know what I don't like? The pundits are getting Trump wrong, that, you know, they're misreading what he's saying. And I don't understand why that, you know, what he's saying now is completely consistent, you know, with what he was saying during the campaign. And I'm thinking to myself, you can't simultaneously say that the president is going to be unpredictable on foreign policy um, and nonetheless is, is fully transparent and consistent in terms of what he's doing. Or let me rephrase that. It actually is possible. Um, if you can be fully articulate in terms of what your strategy is, but you can actually be more opaque in terms of your tactics, that is a way in which you can combine these two. But I have seen no evidence to, do, to date that this White House understands that distinction. I think they think of unpredictability as a genuine asset. But as you say, there are other people in the administration that don't recognize that there are times where you actually need to send a clear and credible signal. Um, and these two things are in conflict with each other. Um, but I'm not sure that the White House has figured that out yet. So I want to actually pull back to to the actual nuclear threat on the Korean Peninsula and say something shockingly non-pessimistic for me, um, mm-hmm. which is that I have been fascinated over the last five or six days by ha- the the bipartisan, um, nonpartisan um, policy intellectuals, military folks 
um, former authors of some of the more hawkish Korea policies who have come out and said, look, the end game here is we're going to have to talk to the North Koreans. Uh Um, That you had, you know, a William Perry piece in Politico on this. Um, You had Richard Haas. And sort of noted, sorry, just sorry to interrupt, but Perry was one of the people who wrote an op-ed, was it five years ago, six years ago, that basically argued in favor of a preemptive military strike against North Korea. Yes, yes. Um, and Richard Haas, who, of course, was work, worked these policy issues in the George W. Bush administration, um, arguing that you are eventually going. And, and, and I think all of them, frankly, trying to say, look, if you're going to sling your missiles around like this with the North Koreans, let's try to get something out of it and use that to move to the table, um, which, frankly, um, I think would be, you know, that would be a sort of best of all possible worlds outcome here. Um I don't, if I were the North Koreans, I certainly wouldn't feel ready to make any kind of deal. I mean, who the hell knows? I don't want to pretend I know anything about what the North Koreans think, in all honesty. But um, but it's a, it's a very, you know, the substance of the moment that we're in is very interesting. And, and I, um, this, I think, is one place where the starkness of what we're presented with, the sort of possibility of escalation, which we had a nice demonstration of, that it was encouraging to me to see that, you know, sort of four months into into this regime of unpredictability, one of its effects is that you can have a group of, of sort of centrist establishment people who would not six months ago, I think, have been willing to say, you know what, we're going to have to talk to the North Koreans in public, all coming out and saying, you know what, we're going to have to talk to the North Koreans. Right. So I will say, let me say a few things on this. The, the the first, and I'm actually going to say some praise for Trump, which I didn't think I was going to, but um, the first thing is is that, to be fair, again, to the Trump administration, they inherited this. This is not entirely a situation, this is certainly not a situation of, of their design, just in the same way that the Obama administration inherited this from the Bush administration, which inherited this from the Clinton administration. Yep. This has been a decades-long policy nightmare um, in which there have never been any good options. Um, and anyone who tells you other than that is selling you something because, you know, even even if the military option had been pursued, you know, in in the late 90s or in the 2000s, it would have been that much more messy. I have no uh, no doubt of that. There's so, a reason it wasn't pursued. And there's a reason that both the Clinton, just in case anyone watching doesn't know this, both the Clinton administration and the W administration looked at the numbers and said, oh, no, no, that is that is not a good. You know, you, you thought. You thought there were there was no military adventurism. The American National Security Establishment didn't like this. Is the counterfactual? You know there is there is a limit of carnage and possible um, sort of spreading into regional or global war that everyone in American foreign policy does understand that you gotta you gotta not go there. Absolutely. So to be fair to the Trump administration, this was already this was already going to be a difficult thing for them to do. This is not uh, you know not entirely on them. Second and related to that, it's not like you know. It's worth noting, China is in just as bad a situation strategically on this situation as the United States. And there's a great article in the Post today that points out that China's North Korea Korea policy now lies in tatters. Because essentially, the problem that that China has is they've always argued, well, we should talk to North Korea. This policy of pressure isn't necessarily going to work. But in response to repeated North Korean provocations, the Chinese have, have imposed sanctions on them. And the North Koreans have basically flipped them the bird. They're, they're, they're in no way deterred by the emphasis on sanctions. And furthermore, China had tried to sanction South Korea because South Korea was um, <coughs> the forward deployment of, of THAAD uh, was going forward. And the Chinese didn't like that because as much as THAAD was, was justified, you could argue, because of the North Korean threat, the Chinese saw it as a way to also uh, deter and, and um, uh, generate problems for, for China's airspace. Um, uh, on the border, and despite sanctioning South Korean companies and, and uh, uh, a whole variety of South Korean entities, that is still going forward. So um, the Chinese are in, in just as uh, difficult a situation, in some ways more difficult, because as bad as this situation looks from the U.S. perspective, it is worth pointing out repeatedly that, that and it, despite the North Korean military parade that freaked out a lot of people, North Korea still doesn't have an ICBM that can hit the United States. Um, and it's going to be at least a few years before they do have that. Whereas on the other hand, China is in the neighborhood, so they don't necessarily want to, to deal with this. The third point and last point I will make is that this might actually be the one area where Trump's willingness to not necessarily uh, listen to you know the blob or whatever you want to talk about could 
work to his advantage, not in the sense of acting in a more hawkish direction, but acting in a more dovish direction. Which is to say that if Trump were to authorize one of his officials to go to Pyongyang to engage in direct talks, um, this is one of those things that that would potentially, as you say, it's something that, that you're now seeing people even like Haas and Perry recommending. But I can see, it, it, again, if it was a Clinton or an Obama administration doing this, they would catch all kinds of hell from the right for going in that direction. Whereas if Trump does it, he will, you know, it's going to be only Trump can go to Pyongyang, as it were. Well, I don't know that we might have to leave it there with only Trump can go to Pyongyang. I'm not, that's I'm not sure. That's, yeah. I, I think because I think we've just both basically said Mary for North Korea. And I'm not sure how we can talk, um, how we can top that. That's so, true. So as it so, turns out, he's going to marry our Turkey and North Korea. Well done. But yeah, that's that's what we voted for, America. Exactly. So, so. congratulations, America. We're going to have some interesting, you know, weddings coming forward. Yeah, it's going to be great food at the reception, though. There we go. That's great true. food at the reception. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. Until next time. Which we will hopefully be a little more uh, more quickly than the last time. We, we, we clearly have to increase the tempo of our podcast if, if for no other reason that there are a lot of other really good foreign policy podcasts that the competition has gotten thicker. That is true. That is true. We have, uh, we've, we've, um, just like the United States, Dan, we've gone from, um, <laughs> we've gone from being the sole superpower to having spawned and aided our own competition. Ah, damn it. You're right. All right. With that, thank you. And okay. uh, until next time. Bye-bye.